Father, I thank you for the day. I pray that you would be with us through our study today. I pray that you would, as always, teach and lead and guide us. And Lord, as we uh, delve in today the issues that we bring to the Bible, I pray that you would help us to be especially sensitive and, uh, Lord, to truly understand our own hearts as best we can. Lord, we thank you for a study like this, and ultimately, Lord, we just ask to know you better. We thank you, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today we are covering what we bring to the text, and in your handy-dandy handout, it is number seven. So, um, so kind of like I talked about in um, the State of the Church address, as well as I think I touched on it last week, but you know, when you have somebody, and let's say they're on their fourth marriage, you're going to have serious baggage. Or think back to the dating days, the person that just goes from one to the other to the other. You're going to have some serious baggage. And every time you enter into this new relationship, you're going to be bringing serious baggage. And it's kind of like the old days when people had the hard case suitcases and everywhere they traveled, they'd put a sticker on their, on their suitcase that showed off where they traveled. Every single new relationship, you bring a little bit of baggage, at least a little, from every single one of those trips. The problem with that is that the new person didn't sign up to deal with all your baggage. Now, if they're smart, they would know that they're signing up to deal with it because that's part of being human. But we're stupid. We don't think that way. We just think that, oh, I've met this great person. It's a blank slate. We're starting completely fresh, and it doesn't work that way. And it's the same thing when we come to the text. The same thing with a church and a pastor, by the way. But it's the same thing when we come to the text. Every time we come to the text, we're bringing baggage with us. And I've talked about this at some level, but we're going to go more in depth in this chapter. So what is the baggage? And I don't care if you cheat a little bit and look at your handout or just remember from previously, but what are examples of baggage that we bring to the text when we read? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... Yeah. Or it's a different version of what somebody else has heard. Yeah. So preconceived ideas and sometimes maybe misunderstandings because of language differences, and then pre learned theology, right? Is theology a bad thing? No as long as it's subject to the Bible, right? Theology should come out of the Bible. It should emanate from Scripture the same way that heat and light emanate from the sun. What's wrong is when we, like, make our own light bulbs and that's not emanating from the sun anymore, right? What are some other, what's some other baggage? You guys have kind of hit some of the major categories, but what, what's some other baggage? Let's think for a second, because this is really important. Yeah, our culture is a big one. Yep, and, and yes, to your point, uh, there are a lot of things that the Bible tells us are wrong that our culture not only wants to tolerate in the old sense of tolerance, as in, okay, you do you, I do me, that's pretty much an American concept. That, that's, as an American, you're fine there, but not anymore, not with new tolerance. Now you have to accept and celebrate what other people are doing if you want to be in the good graces of woke culture. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, so culture is a huge one. 
And then everything we have ever been taught about that passage, which I think is what Jill was getting at, not just the, the King James versus a newer version and maybe some misunderstanding, but I think she was also touching on previous teaching, right? Every time you listen to somebody that's teaching the Bible, they're trying to persuade you that the text means A, B, C, D, whatever. Now, they may be in good faith trying to persuade you, they may just be reading it straight to you. And that particular day, it struck you a certain way because you just got finished having a fight with your spouse or you had a wonderful day and it's sunshine, moonbeams, and unicorns and rainbows. Like, even just listening to the text, the day that you had is going to affect the way that you receive what's being said. And then you add all the other things in there. Maybe you have done your due diligence and you've studied theology before. Maybe you've read the Bible enough times you're starting to develop a big bird's eye view. By the way, I would say that it takes three or four times of reading the Bible all the way through to have even a decent bird's eye view of the picture. I mean, think about that. If you have a, an in-depth conversation with someone that you're close to, whether it be a spouse or a best friend, and you, you share your life stories, right? I mean, how many times for those that have been in long-term relationships, and again, that's whether friends or spouses, how many times have you guys shared your life story with each other at, at some reasonable amount, not just, you know, an individual memory, but oh yeah, childhood, and then you kind of go off on be what your childhood was or what your dating years were, right? And in all honesty, if you were like on, uh, oh, what was that show? The Newlyweds, right? You know, they think they know everything about each other, right? And a lot of times newlyweds do. Oh yeah, I know everything I need to know about that person. Uh, no, you don't. You've heard a story a time or two, but you haven't even heard their history enough to understand their history, much less do you understand who they are right now. And, and I'm giving the benefit of the doubt that they're both being open and transparent in their communication. So again, it's the same thing with scripture. It is, it is unrealistic and naive to think that if you have read through the Bible a single time, and most people haven't even read through the Bible a single time, and I put the post up a couple days ago on Facebook. I don't know if you saw it, but it was a very small percentage of people that have ever read the Bible a single time and a much smaller number of people that have read it multiple times. So it's very, very naive to think that in every other area of life, you have to keep digging and keep practicing and keep hearing the story over and over and that that doesn't work that way in Scripture. If you've only been through the Bible once, if you haven't been through the Bible a single time, then as lovingly as I can say this, you don't know the Bible yet. Which means decisions that you make, ideas that you form, all of that is actually regurgitated information based on what you've been taught by human beings who are fallible, who are going to twist things to their own bent, whether intentionally or not. So it's, it's scary in church when you have leaders that don't know the Bible and they're the ones making the decision and they think it's based on Scripture, but they don't actually know the Bible well enough to make biblical decisions because they don't know the Bible. And then you bring that into the home. Biblically, men are called to be the leaders in the home. Now, it doesn't mean that they're the most qualified. It doesn't mean that they're the smartest. It just means that that's who God put in charge of the family spiritual life. Why? I don't know. I mean, theologically, it's because God created Adam first, and then God told us that's what it is. But I don't know why. Why did God choose the tribe of Levi to be the musicians? Why did he choose the house of Aaron to be the priests in the Old Testament? They weren't any better than any of the others. I don't know. It's just who he chose. But what we need to understand is everything that we have been taught is baggage. Now, baggage is not always bad, right? Sometimes the baggage that you bring can be good. We usually think about it as bad in our, in our way of wording things. But baggage can be good. For example, 
Um, if, well, I'll use myself as the example. You know, my dad and I are a lot of like in our raw wiring. The way that we process through information, the, the, the intellectual side of my dad and I are very, very similar. And in, a, in, in, in our raw human wiring, we have a lot of similarities. But because of the abuse that I endured with my dad, and because I got to see the effects of the things that he did, and I saw the root causes, I saw what was happening, how he was processing, and then I saw the effect. That motivated me to learn by a negative example. Okay, if doing this, this, and this leads to this, I don't want that. So baggage is not always bad. Just like your previous teaching on a given passage, you may have had somebody that taught you very well and very accurately a given passage. And if that's the case, then the baggage that you bring can be helpful. But you may also have had somebody teach you something really wrong, and that is not going to be very helpful. So the important thing to understand is that there's baggage. And I know I'm really going in depth here, but this is one of the most important sections of this entire study because this is the one that I think people miss the most. Just like going into a new relationship, people just kind of gloss over as if it's a blank slate, and it's not. The other person has baggage, and you have baggage. Just like a church and a pastor, right? The pastor's gonna bring some stuff with him, and the church is gonna have some stuff with them. It's not all necessarily bad, it's certainly not all gonna be good, but if you're not aware that it's there, that's where you're gonna have the problems. So as we delve into this, and again, it's uh, chapter seven, it does actually have um, a bit of the outline in your handout here. So as we go into this, again, I hope that that will help make more sense. Um, so I'll read a little bit here. I'm not gonna read everything. I don't think this is all overly helpful, but I, I do wanna read the intro here. One context that is often overlooked is the context of the reader, the world from which the reader approaches the text. We as readers of the Bible are not by nature neutral and objective. That's you know kind of like the scientific community. They think that they're neutral and objective and they're ignoring the human side, right? It always skews the results. We bring a lot of preconceived notions and influences with us to the text when we read. Thus, we need to discuss and evaluate these pretext influences, lest they mislead us in our search for the meaning of the text. So the example that he gives is Luke 2.1 in the King James, and it came to pass in those days that there was a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Let's begin with a story. Danny and his family spent several years working as missionaries in Ethiopia. Right after moving down country, Danny was privileged to watch a Christmas pageant presented by an Ethiopian evangelical church in Dilla, Ethiopia. Was that ever a different experience? There were no Christmas trees with lights, nor was there any snow. The weather was balmy and there were banana trees growing right outside the church. Over 400 people crowded into the church building, which had seating for maybe 150 or so. Of course, we use the term seating loosely. The pews consisted of uncomfortable benches constructed out of rough, uneven, hand-cut lumber. The church had dirt floors where fleas flourished, mud walls plastered with white and lime plaster, rafters made of eucalyptus poles of various sizes, and a corrugated steel roof. Whenever the sun would go behind a cloud, the, the change in temperature on the corrugated steel roof would cause it co to contract, creating a, sorry, I lost my place, creating a creaking, groaning sound for several seconds. Then the sun would again emerge, causing the roof to get hot again, and the corrugated steel would repeat the ritual moans until the metal had expanded back to its original size. Thus, a certain background rhythm of roof groaning developed. The inside of the church was lit by only two 40-watt light bulbs. Most of the needed light was usually provided by numerous windows on each side, but on this particular day, much of the light was blocked by the dozens of eager spectators jammed around each window outside the church. 
standing on their tiptoes and craning their necks trying to see. They had arrived too late to get a seat. Christmas pageants in the United States are fairly typical, or stereotypical. Danny assumed that this one would be similar. How else can you tell the story? Was he in for a shock? And there you have an example, right? I mean, think about just the concept of church. When you read the word church in the New Testament, what do you picture? An American church, probably this church, right? Because this is the one, and especially here in Reevesville, this is the one that most of you have literally been in your whole lives. You've visited other churches, or maybe a few of you were imported from outside, but for the most part, this is church to you because it's the only church you've ever known. And as we've said several times over the last number of months to a year, if we had told you a year before the pandemic that there would come a time where the people of Reesville Baptist would not only willingly choose to sit in their cars in the parking lot during service, but also at least at certain points demand to sit in their cars during a church service instead of being in the building and that no one would go in the building for the most part for an entire year you would have said that, you, that the person was crazy. Had I, not that, that, I don't believe that version of prophecy still happens today, but let's pretend that I had been a prophet in my um, hiring time, what I can't think of the word, candidacy for this church, and I had told you guys, hey, you know, there's going to come a time where under my leadership, ha ha, we're all going to be out in the parking lot and not in the building. I guarantee you the church would not have hired me right? Because that flies in the face of everything that we have known about church until now. See, even the word church, you picture this. But in the New Testament, when you read the word church, what are you supposed to picture? Yeah, to a degree, it's just wherever two or more gather, right? My pre-understanding, I always assume church universal. I always think of it in terms of all churches at all times, which means not buildings, but people. All saved people from all time. When I read the word church, that's what I picture. But that's not always accurate, because if I'm reading the, in the book of Romans and he mentions church, what's he talking about in, in most cases? The church in Rome, the, the group of believers that met together in Rome. And if we're reading Colossians, right, the church at Colossae, right, see, even something that simple, how many times, I'm being honest, how many times have you ever read the New Testament and when you ran across the word church, you specifically pictured exactly the group that the, the writer was mentioning? Probably not. I know better, and I still don't do it half the time, right? So again, that's a pre-understanding that we bring to the text. Now, what are the dangers even with that simple example of church? That we'll misinterpret the text. Yeah, the ultimate consequence is that we're going to misinterpret the text, or at least very potentially. But what are some other consequences? What are some other dangers to even something that simple as the word church. Think about how different church is for the story that I just read from the book, right? Anybody been on a mission trip? What did the church look like when you went on that mission trip? Mm-hmm. See, here in America, we have fights over the color of carpet and what temperature to keep the thermostat. <laughs> exactly, right? And here's the thing, do those people really care? No, why?
Satan met in secret a lot of times because they were afraid of persecution. We, we know you, you don't know that feeling. Yeah. I won't say that they're all afraid of persecution, though. I mean, even where we were at, I, I wouldn't say that they were afraid of persecution. As an American, how do we usually define persecution? I mean, the, the American church, when the American church says that it's persecuted, what does that usually mean? Yeah. I got my feelings hurt. I was scared to say something about Jesus, and somebody looked at me funny. I'm being persecuted. We need to boycott something, right? That's not persecution. See, God has blessed our country, and we don't know why. But the problem is we've become spoiled, and we don't have our priorities right. We're not focused on the Bible. We're focused on our creature comforts. We're not focused on doing ministry. We're focused on having it our way and our traditions. And Jesus talked to the Pharisees a lot about that, Quite frankly, that's the American church for the most part. So when we read the word church, there's a whole range of meanings and consequences and implications. We're fighting about temperature. They're fighting for their lives. Here's another quick example. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of teaching on this just as much as I am the pre-understanding, but I want this to, to, to drive home. You know, I've heard numerous times, and this church is pretty gracious on this. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. This church is pretty gracious. I have not personally, and the gossip mill may be going differently, but I have not personally been harassed about going long on sermons. But I have heard multiple comments, especially apparently there's a question of when we get back into the building, you know, am I still going to preach as long? Well... The answer is I'm going to preach as long as it takes. I want to try and keep things to an hour because that's what Americans expect. At the same time, if we fill up the schedule with all kinds of things that are not preaching, then I've got to take the time that's necessary because I answer to God for whether or not I communicate what he tells me to communicate through the word. But as you read through the New Testament, does anybody remember a certain man uh, when, was it Paul or Peter? I think it was Paul was preaching right? Paul preached until when? Anybody remember that story? Yeah. Paul preached until dawn. Guy fell asleep, fell out the window, and died because he was so exhausted. But he didn't have to stay. He could have left. He could have gone home. He could have chosen to curl up and take a nap right there. Why did that man stay until dawn? By the way, he was brought back to life. Not to leave you on a dead end there. Why did he stay? Think about your trip to Haiti. Why did they come? You know, Michelle, you went to Peru. Why did those people travel from so far? Because they were after God. They wanted to know the truth. They wanted the word. In America, we want a 15-minute sermon to make me feel good and go on my way. So even something as simple as the word church, we've been talking about this for what, 15 minutes now, the word church? We'll say 10 minutes. And we haven't even scratched the surface on the differences just in the word church. So do we bring baggage to the text when we read the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. Just like every relationship, just like everything else in our human world, we have our own ideas and our own understanding. See, and and again, I'm, I'm kind of just teaching pastorally at the moment, but there comes a life, there comes a point in the life of every believer early on in their faith. And by the way, when I say early on, remember, physical age and spiritual maturity have nothing to do with each other. Nothing to do with each other. The only correlation is that in theory, somebody that is older should have more life experience that in theory should help them understand more. 
but they also have more baggage. So spiritual maturity and physical age have nothing to do with each other. All right, where was I headed? At a point that I was trying to get to. I don't know. It'll come to me in a moment, or it wasn't that important, I guess. Oh, there comes a point in the life of every believer early on in their faith, and when I say that, I mean spiritual maturity early on in their faith, where they start to feel as if they don't sin much. They feel that they're gaining victory in their sin. Well, you know, it's been a while since I've done that, or, you know, it's, it's been a little bit since I've struggled with this. I, I, you know, I, I used to cuss like a sailor, and now I don't. You know, I used to sleep around all the time, and now I don't. Whatever. Fill in the blank on whatever your example is. But what usually happens early on in the life of a believer is after they have been crushed in the process of salvation, then they start getting a little prideful because they start looking back on what their life used to be, and they start looking at where their life is now, and by comparison, their life should be more pleasing to God than it was then. But they start getting to the point where they think, okay, you know, I'm doing okay here. I, I really, you know, I'm not struggling with sin as, as much as I used to. As you mature, you start understanding the depths of sin. As you mature, you start understanding how, how rooted in every thought and deed sin truly is. Think about our conversation about the word church. How arrogant and selfish do we have to be to assume that our version of church is the definition of church? Think about that for a moment. I'm not trying to call you out compared to me. I've already confessed I do the same thing. But think about it. If my understanding of church, if I read the New Testament and my understanding of the word church is my experience, and by the way, your experience, you, you're, by, by nature of being a human being, you're assuming that yours is correct. You look back on your version as being right. Just like the example that I gave you guys previously about picture a swing set, right? What's your swing set? Is it blue? Is it wood? Is it red? Whatever, right? Because in your mind, that's what a swing set is. Well, the same thing with church. Who said your way is the right one? But we automatically assume it is. That's how deep our sin is. Our sin is so pervasive and so deep in our hearts and minds that we literally automatically assume that our version is not only right, but normative, meaning it's, it's, it should be the case for everyone. And not to throw stones... But that's all the more true in a church that has largely been isolated, such as Reevesville, and a thousand other small churches across the U.S. So I'm not picking on Reevesville. It just wouldn't be right for me not to point that out. Because even though you guys, a lot of you have visited other churches, many of the people at Reevesville have never spent any significant time at another church. So you literally don't know another way of doing church. And the same for anybody listening online, whether they're at Reevesville or, again, one of any thousands of churches out there. If that's the only church you've ever known, then you literally don't know anything else. So pay attention to how deep your sin is. And that's a spiritual lesson that I'm stumbling on as well as teaching for this section in our study. You've got to pay attention to the depth of your sin because you're automatically making assumptions and bringing those to the text. And that is very dangerous. Now, we've kind of hit on pre-understanding, so I'm not going to spend more time there. Um, let me find the next section here before I move on to what I was going to say. All right, let me... 
Oh, that must be the other chapter. Okay. Well, let me ask this question because he's, it must be buried in here somewhere. It's one of the other chapters. Let me ask this question, and actually let's turn to your uh, handout on chapter 7, because I'm pretty sure it was there. Um, no, it's not. I'm not sure where it is. We'll get back to your handout in a second. Um, now that I've gotten you all down on yourself, and you should be for this, by the way, can we be neutral? Can we be unbiased? No. I wanted you to feel the pain of wrestling with that for a second. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like, okay, each person slowly going, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. No, we can't be neutral. We can't be unbiased. That's the goal, right? Just like my goal is to be perfect in Christ, but until I'm glorified and in heaven, that ain't going to happen. I can't be completely unbiased, and you have to accept that. That is also baggage that you bring to the text, because if you honestly think that you can be unbiased, you're bringing a boatload of trouble with you to the text, and that will dramatically influence the way that you interpret. For example, if you honestly think that you can be unbiased, and going back to our discussion on the word church, think about the implications of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very good point, right? Um, so you have, you know, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist. Most people would agree those are all Christian, right? There's, there are very few people that would argue that that group's not saved. I mean, we, we make jokes about it, but... I don't know anybody that's rational, that's a Christian, that's going to say, well, if you're a Presbyterian, you can't be saved because blah, 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 or if you're a Baptist or whatever, right? And yet the way that you do church, the way that you worship, and the way that typically Scripture is understood is very different. And that's kind of like what you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard it from a little bit from some of the older Baptists too, the same way. They did, but it was a time when everybody was Christian in the country mm -hmm. actively, mm -hmm. and they were seeking the the other membership from the other mm -hmm. nations. Um, but I, I think there was a, a time where mm -hmm. a lot of different, different denominations felt that way. Yeah. Um, so historically, um, yeah, so there was a time, excuse me, there was a time where the majority of American would have said they were Christian. Um, the majority of America being Christians, a very arguable point, but there was a large, there was a time where the large portion of people would have said that they're Christian, yes. Um, the, the idea of someone from another denomination not being saved is not part of the doctrine of most of the major groups like Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, etc. So you may have had groups or sects that would have said that, but that was never part of the doctrine or the understanding of most of them. And that goes back to probably my bias growing up Church of Christ of seeing, of, of yeah. seeing that in the in yeah. Church of Christ. Yeah, yeah. because Church of Christ, some Pentecostal groups view it the same way. Not all Pentecostal, but some Pentecostal groups view it the same way. If you don't speak in tongues and or you're not part of the Pentecostal group, then you're not a Christian. Um, so there are certainly some denominations, so that's a great job of teasing out your own bias. Um, not, that, not that there weren't groups within some of those that either would have said it or more realistically they would have acted like it. Um, you know, and that's where the church stealing comes from. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, right? I mean, each, each group has a slightly different understanding of Scripture. Now, here's where you can go wrong, and, I, and I've heard it in this church, so pay attention and be careful, because I've heard this in this church. 
I've heard some people make the comment, well, that's your opinion, that's that person's opinion, everybody's got an opinion, but they're talking about things related to the Bible. And the point that the person is making when they make that comment is that we're, we're all simultaneously right. Well, that's modern American relativism. Here's the thing. There are things within the Baptist church that I guarantee you are wrong. There are things within being the Methodist church that I guarantee you are wrong. There are things in Presbyterian and all the different groups. We interpret Scripture differently. In some areas, it doesn't matter, right? Whether we do three hymns and stand up in between each one or not, or sit down in between each one or not, or whether we stand the whole time, right? I mean, let me, let me rock some of your worlds with this one. Is there anything wrong with the modern American worship? Now, hear me carefully. Is there anything wrong in modern American worship with having colorful lights and fog machines and loud music? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing inherently wrong with those things, as always, unless the focus is off of Christ. If those things lead people toward Christ, there is nothing wrong with them. Because there are certain denominations that say even having music is wrong. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, right? So there are preferential things that just don't matter. And unfortunately, those are the things, and I'm preaching again, but those are the things churches spend their time arguing and fighting about. Whether we should have contemporary music, traditional music, well, I like the hymns, well, I like the new songs, well, I like this. When did church become about I? That's idolatry. <laughs> I'm here all day, literally today. <laughs> I, I will be here all day today, basically. Um, right? I mean, seriously, that is idolatry. But that's where we spend the majority of our time. So let me introduce, and this, this is not in here. It's somewhere in this book, but it's not in this section, but it applies. There are major doctrines, and then there are secondary and third level, tertiary doctrines. Major doctrines, there is a right and a wrong. It is black and white. You believe it or you don't. You are saved or you are not based on some of those things. Jesus is God. That is not up for debate. There is, there is no debating that one. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. Secondary doctrine Jesus was born of a virgin. Well, I guess I shouldn't have given you the answer, but let me ask the question now that I've basically given you the answer. Does believing that Jesus was born of a virgin, is that required for salvation? Why not? <laughs> it's like I'll throw your own words back at you. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. And I agree with you, but what is your what is your statement based upon? What is the lowest level common denominator of what you just said? Nope. The the logic side. Oh, that the Bible is inspired. Bingo. Do you have to believe the Bible is inspired in order to be saved? No, because first century Christians very seldom saw a Bible, so it was, you know. Yeah. But you see how easy that is. My instinct would be say, of course you have to believe he was born of a virgin. But when you actually think it through, no, because that's, that's assuming that somebody believes that the Bible is inspired. The Bible, there is no Bible verse that says you must, thou shalt believe the Bible is inspired in order to earn salvation. All right, you don't earn salvation, by the way. 
I threw that in there on purpose. But that's not, I mean, you can find that in Second Opinions chapter 3 where most people quote from. But that's not actually in Scripture. So there are major doctrines that we must believe in order to be saved. Then there are secondary doctrines that are of supreme importance but are not salvific. They're not, your salvation is not dependent upon them. And I would say the inspiration of Scripture is one of those second, secondary major doctrine, but not a primary major doctrine. So secondary doctrines, they're very important. They are extremely important. And I think that secondary doctrines have to do with faithfulness. Are we being faithful in our worship and service to God? If we're faithful in our worship and service to God, we must believe that the Bible is inspired because God gave us the Bible and it claims inspiration of itself. So in order to be faithful in my daily walk sense, then yes, you must believe the Bible is inspired. And therefore, anyone that learns about the virgin birth from the scripture ought to believe it. But that is a faithfulness of walk and understanding, not a salvation. The secondary doctrines are largely where the different denominations come from. Because different ones weight different things differently. So is there room to disagree on some of those? Yes, but less room than the third level stuff. Right? I mean... Almost all major denominations agree that the Bible is inspired. Now, some of them treat it more loosely than others, but almost all of them agree that the Bible is inspired. So, I th I'm sorry. Hmm? Would you say something like believing gay marriage would be a secondary doctrine or a primary doctrine? I would, list, I would list that as secondary because it has nothing to do with your salvation. Okay. Um, it's, you, you wouldn't know that it's wrong per se without reading scripture. Now, Romans chapter 1 does talk about how even nature testifies, I'm going to paraphrase, but Romans chapter 1 for reference, you can go read. Even Romans chapter 1 talks about how nature testifies to the way that God intended his creation to be. But again, that doesn't have anything specifically to do with salvation. That has to do with understanding right and wrong. The salvation is based on faith in Christ. Um, that, that's not based on your, un, your correct understanding of X, Y, or Z. Okay? Now, in Romans chapter 1, it talks about how people exchange unnatural or exchange natural lusts for unnatural. Therefore, God gives them over to a reprobate mind and so on and so on. Verses 24, 26, and 28 specifically talk about God delivering those people over to their own lusts. And it, it talks about how that is a, a judgment upon them and they're not saved. But that's, that's talking about, um, oh, how do I want to word this for the sake of time? Um, that is talking about lost people acting like lost people and continuing to act like lost people. The specific example, of course, in that case being homosexuality. Um, Right now, we're talking about the idea of what is required for salvation. So all that's required for salvation ultimately is those major doctrines such as Jesus can pay for our sins. He is God. But part of salvation is repenting of your sins and turning away. Mm -hmm. So if, if homosexuality is a sin, mm -hmm. you would be needing to repent of that and turn away from it. Yeah, Absolutely. And so is lust. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not being easy on homosexuality. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same thing as, let's say, you've got a prostitute that you've been witnessing to. Um, almost as if Jesus had done that, right? And this prostitute is supposed to give up their lifestyle now. That is the same thing. Absolutely. Um, and then we get into secondary and third level doctrines where somebody that is continuing to live that lifestyle, that's the evidence they weren't really saved. But struggling with that sin by itself does not, does not prevent salvation. Salvation is in the person and the work of Christ. Struggling with it 
doesn't have anything to do with it happening, continuing to live in a pattern of sin is the proof that it never happened. Does that make sense? Okay. I want to make sure, because that's a tricky one. (laughs) Okay. So secondary doctrines would be things that are very supremely important, but they're not having to do with salvation itself. So how many things do you think fit in that primary doctrine category? Very small, right? I mean, ultimately, you have to believe that Jesus has the ability to do what he promised, and you have to have faith, you have to trust in Christ that he is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. If he says he can save you, then he can save you. You repent and believe. That's the primary doctrine. Honestly, I can't think of anything else that's primary other than God is God, but you, you wouldn't believe that Jesus, you wouldn't be believing that Jesus is God if you didn't already believe that God is God, right? Here's, here's one to mess with your head, and then we're going to have to pick this back up next week. Is it possible, let's say you're, you're a missionary in India or America, is it possible that someone can have an intellectual understanding that says that there are multiple gods. But in their heart, they come to believe in Jesus. But in their head, they still think about some of the other gods. Is it possible for that person to be saved? See, baggage is not easy to get rid of. If you've been raised your whole life, for example, in India, Hinduism, that there are various gods of every sort, you're still going to struggle with that in your brain for a while. But if you put it into the proper perspective of there's one, only one true and living God, and what you had grown up knowing as God is nothing more than man-made, mm-hmm. and you know that there's only one true living God, yes, I think that's possible. But you still will have those vivid you still images. Have those lies, yes. Every time you see the same thing, you're going to have multiple yeah. images. <laughs> which, which is why I said it would mess with your head, right? <laughs> you can't believe that all those gods are real and be saved. But for it to still exist in your head and still come up, that would be normal because you're going to have that baggage. And I'd almost put patriotism in there. I mean, I think, whoa, whoa. No, seriously. To be continued. (laughs) There are a lot of things that are secondary and third level that people try to make first level. But we have church here. But the point of all of this at the moment is that there are very few things in that first level understanding. Now, I think understanding that there's only one true God would be one of those primary doctrines, right? There's a few of them, but not many. The problem comes when we try to make second and third level and especially fourth level when we try to shove those into the wrong category, that's where we run into the trouble and that's where we start having the fights where people are throwing scripture at each other left and right and both of them are missing the point. So we've gotta be careful, we'll pick this back up next week. This is not in the book, so Sheila, I'm gonna count on you to remind me where we left off because we're, we're, we're related to this chapter but he covers this somewhere else and I don't remember where. So I'll close this in prayer. Father, I just thank you for the day. I pray that you would help us to be very careful in the way that we understand um, our reading and ourselves. And Lord, it's, it's just amazing the way that you chose, us, chose to give us scripture where you've got so many things going on. And, and yet, in spite of all of these areas for error, and we do have error, Lord, in spite of all of this, 
you're still faithful to give us understanding and to lead us in a way that draws us closer to you. And Father, again, that is ultimately our goal and our purpose. And Father, we thank you, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen.